Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa This Dhamma is for one whose mind is concentrated, not for one whose mind is unconcentrated. That's Tanajan Jeff's uh, translation from our Root Sutta, Anguttara 8, number 30. And so to provide an overview, I'll be doing various shorter readings on this topic of concentration. And to be, and this will in the beginning, and that will be from chapter 9 of Ajahn Jeff's book, On the Path, which is on the Noble Eightfold Path. And then I, the last longer reading will be Majjhima Nikaya 39. And so this chapter 9 is Right Concentration. And it, the chapter begins on... Uh, page 419. And this is a reading that he, I'll start with a reading that he included, which is um, appropriate for these readings. It's about actually listening. Monks endowed with five dhammas, even though listening to the true dhamma, one is incapable of alighting on the orderliness, on the rightness of skillful dhammas. Which five? One holds the talk in contempt. One holds the speaker in contempt. One holds oneself in contempt. One listens to the dhamma with a scattered mind, a mind not gathered into one. The Pali is anikagachito. One attends inappropriately. Endowed with these five dhammas, even though listening to the true dhamma, one is incapable of alighting on the orderliness, on the rightness of skillful dhammas. Endowed with the five opposite dhammas, when listening to the true dhamma, one is capable of alighting on the orderliness, on the rightness of skillful dhammas. Which five? One does not hold the talk in contempt. One does not hold the speaker in contempt one does not hold oneself in contempt. One listens to the Dhamma with an unscattered mind, a mind gathered into one, which is ekagachito. One attends appropriately. Endowed with these five Dhammas, when listening to the true Dhamma, one is capable of alighting on the orderliness, on the rightness of skillful Dhammas. And that's Anguttara fives, Number 151. Now this is a short excerpt from Majjhima Nikaya 44. This is Wisaka speaking. Now what is concentration? What dhammas are its themes? What dhammas are its requisites? And what is its development? Sister Dhammadina responds, Singleness, a kagata of mind, is concentration. The four establishings of mindfulness are its themes. The four right exertions are its requisites. And any cultivation, development, and pursuit of these dhammas is its development. Now here's a short excerpt from Majjhima Nikaya 117. The Blessed One said, Now what, monks, is noble right concentration with its supports and requisite conditions? Any singleness of mind equipped with these seven factors, right view, right resolve, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, and right mindfulness is called noble right concentration with its supports and requisite conditions.
And now I'll be reading Anguttara 4's um, number 41. It's about the four developments of concentration. There are these four developments of concentration. Which four? Oh, and just note that Ajahn Jeff abbreviates quite a bit here, but I'll just read it as, as it's written. There are these four developments of concentration. Which four? There is a development of concentration that, when developed and pursued, leads to a pleasant abiding in the here and now. There is a development of concentration that leads to the attainment of knowledge and vision. There is a development of concentration that leads to mindfulness and alertness. There is a development of concentration that, when developed and pursued, leads to the ending of effluence. And what is the development of concentration that, when developed and pursued, leads to a pleasant abiding in the here and now? There is the case where a monk enters and remains in the four jhanas. This is the development of concentration that leads to a pleasant abiding in the here and now. And what is the development of con that leads to the attainment of knowledge and vision? There is the case where a monk attends to the perception of light and is resolved on the perception of daytime. Day is the same as night. Night is the same as day. By means of an awareness open and unhampered, he develops a brightened mind. This is the development of concentration that leads to the attainment of knowledge and vision. And what is the development of concentration that leads to mindfulness and alertness? There is the case where feelings are known to the monk as they arise, known as they persist, known as they subside. Perceptions are known to him as they arise, known as they persist, known as they subside. Thoughts are known to him as they arise known as they persist, known as they subside. This is the development of concentration that leads to mindfulness and alertness. And what is the, the development of concentration that leads to the ending of effluence? There is the case where a monk remains focused on arising and a falling away with reference to the five clinging aggregates, such as form, such as origination, such as disappearance, such as feeling, such as perception, such are fabrications, such as consciousness, such its origination, such di its disappearance. This is the development of concentration that leads to the ending of effluence. These are the four developments of concentration. Okay, and now I'll be proceeding to Majjhima Nikaya 39, the Greater Discourse at Asapura. And it might be useful just to mention in context, this is one of these gradual progressions. And Ajahn Jeff put various head, uh, headings. And so the first one is shame and compunction. So it's sort of like a monk, or somebody developing different qualities in the first uh, header is shame and compunction. Then it goes on to purity of contact. Then it goes on to restraint of, of the senses. Then moderation in eating. Then wakefulness. And then mindfulness and alertness. And then the, the, next, the next section is abandoning the hindrances, which is where I'll start. And this precedes the four jhanas. And there are different analogies for going beyond uh, the hindrances. And I appreciate that at each time when the hindrances has gone beyond, it says because of that, he would experience joy and happiness. And I'll also just uh, let you know which, which hindrance is, is being referred to. Abandoning the hindrances. And what more is to be done? There is the case where a monk seeks out a secluded dwelling a forest, the shade of a tree, a mountain, a glen, a hillside cave, 
a charnel ground, a forest grove, the open air, a heap of straw. After his meal, returning from his alms round, he sits down, crosses his legs, holds his body erect, and brings mindfulness to the fore. Abandoning covetousness with regard to the world, he dwells with an awareness devoid of covetousness. He cleanses his mind of covetousness. Abandoning ill will and anger, he dwells with an awareness devoid of ill will, sympathetic with the welfare of all living beings. He cleanses his mind of ill will and anger. Abandoning sloth and drowsiness, he dwells with an awareness devoid of sloth and drowsiness, mindful, alert, light. He cleanses his mind of sloth and drowsiness. Abandoning restlessness and anxiety, he dwells undisturbed, his mind inwardly stilled. He cleanses his mind of restlessness and anxiety. Abandoning uncertainty, he dwells having crossed over uncertainty with no perplexity with regard to skillful qualities. He cleanses his mind of uncertainty. And this is the first analogy, and it's about covetousness. Suppose that a man, taking a loan, invest it in his business affairs. His business affairs succeed. He repays his old debts, and there is extra left over for maintaining his wife. The thought would occur to him. Before, taking a loan, I invested it in my business affairs. Now my business affairs have succeeded. I have repaid my old debts, and there is extra left over for maintaining my wife. Because of that, he would experience joy and happiness. Second, on ill will and anger. Now suppose that a man falls sick, in pain, and seriously ill. He does not enjoy his meals, and there is no strength in his body. As time passes, he eventually recovers from that sickness. He enjoys his meals, and there is strength in his body. The thought would occur to him, before I was sick, now I am recovered from that sickness. I enjoy my meals, and there is strength in my body. Because of that, he experienced joy and happiness. Third, sloth and drowsiness. Now suppose that a man is bound in prison. As time passes, he eventually is released from that bondage, safe and sound, with no loss of property. The thought would occur to him, before I was bound in prison, now I am released from that bondage, safe and sound, with no loss of my property. Because of that, he would experience joy and happiness. Fourth, restlessness and anxiety. Now suppose that a man is a slave, subject to others, not subject to himself, unable to go where he likes. As time passes, he eventually is released from that slavery, subject to himself, not subject to others, freed, able to go where he likes. The thought would occur to him, before I was a slave, now I am released from that slavery, subject to myself, not subject to others, free, able to go where I like. Because of that, he would experience joy and happiness. And fifth, uncertainty. Now suppose that a man, carrying money and goods, is traveling by a road through desolate country. As time passes, he eventually emerges from that desolate country, safe and sound, with no loss of property. The thought would occur to him. Before, carrying money and goods, I was traveling by a road through desolate country. Now I have emerged from that desolate country safe and sound, with no loss of my property. Because of that, he would experience joy and happiness. In the same way, when these five hindrances are not abandoned in himself, the monk regards it as a debt, a sickness, a prison, slavery, a road through desolate country. But when these five hindrances are abandoned in himself, he regards it as unindebtedness, good health, release from prison, freedom, a place of security. When he sees that they have been abandoned within him, gladness is born. 
In one who is gladdened, rapture is born. Enraptured at heart, his body grows calm. His body calm, he is sensitive to pleasure. Feeling pleasure, <coughs> his mind becomes concentrated. Now for the section on the four jhanas. <coughs> Quite secluded from sensuality, secluded from unskillful qualities, he enters and remains in the first jhana, rapture and pleasure born of seclusion, accompanied by directed thought and evaluation. <coughs> he permeates and pervades, suffuses and fills this very body with the rapture and pleasure born of seclusion, just as if a dexterous bathman or bathman's apprentice would pour bath powder into a brass basin and knead it together, sprinkling it again and again with water so that his ball of bath powder, saturated, moisture-laden, permeated within and without, would nevertheless not drip. Even so, the monk permeates this very body with the rapture and pleasure born of seclusion. There's nothing of his entire body unpervaded by rapture and pleasure born of seclusion. Furthermore, with the stilling of directed thoughts and evaluations, he enters and remains in the second jhana, rapture and pleasure born of concentration, unification of awareness, free from directed thought and evaluation, internal insurance. He permeates and pervades, suffuses and fills this very body with the rapture and pleasure born of concentration. Just like a lake with spring water welling up from within, having no inflow from the east, west, north, or south, and with the sky supplying abundant showers time and again, so that the cool fount of water welling up from within the lake would permeate and pervade, suffuse and fill it with cool waters, there being no part of the lake unpervaded by the cool waters. Even so, the monk permeates this very body with the rapture and pleasure born of concentration. There is nothing of his entire body unpervaded by rapture and pleasure born of concentration. And furthermore, with the fading of rapture, he remains equanimous, mindful and alert, and senses pleasure with the body. He enters and remains in the third jhana, of which the noble ones declare, equanimous and mindful, he has a pleasant abiding. He permeates and pervades, suffuses and fills this very body with the pleasure divested of rapture. Just as in a lotus pond, some of the lotuses, born and growing up in the water, stay immersed in the water and flourish without standing up out of the water, so that they are permeated and pervaded, suffused and filled with cool water from their roots to their tips. And nothing of those lotuses would be unpervaded with cool water. Even so, the monk permeates this very body with the pleasure divested of rapture. There is nothing of his entire body unpervaded with pleasure divested of rapture. And furthermore, with the abandoning of pleasure and pain, as with the earlier disappearance of joy and distress, he enters and remains in the fourth jhana, purity of equanimity and mindfulness, neither pleasure nor stress. He sits permeating the body with a pure bright awareness, just as if a man were sitting covered from head to foot with a white cloth so that there would be no part of his body to which the white cloth did not extend. Even so, the monk sits, permeating the body with a pure bright awareness. There's nothing of his entire body unperva unpervaded by pure bright awareness. Next section is the three knowledges. With his mind thus concentrated, I'll just read excerpts from this section. With his mind thus concentrated, purified and bright, unblemished, free from defects, pliant, malleable, steady, and attained to imperturbability, he directs it and inclines it to knowledge of the recollection of past lives. He recollects his manifold past lives. In other words, one birth, two births, three births, four, five, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, and so forth. And the second knowledge. With his mind thus concentrated, 
purified and bright, unblemished, free from defects, pliant, malleable, steady, and attain to imperturbability. He directs and inclines it to knowledge of the passing away and reappearance of beings. He sees by means of the divine eye, purified and surpassing the human beings passing away and reappearing. And he discerns how they are inferior and superior, beautiful and ugly, fortunate and unfortunate, in accordance with their kama. These beings who were endowed with bond, bad conduct of body, speech, and mind, who reviled the noble ones, held wrong views, and undertook actions under the influence of wrong views, with the breakup of the body, after death, have reappeared in a plane of deprivation, a bad destination, a lower realm, hell. But these beings who were endowed with good conduct of body, speech, and mind, who did not revile the noble ones, who held right views, and undertook actions under the influence of right views, with the breakup of the body, after death, have reappeared in a good destination, a heavenly world. In the third knowledge, with his mind thus concentrated, purified and bright, unblemished, free from defects, pliant, malleable, steady, and attained to imperturbability, the monk directs and inclines it to the knowledge of the ending of the effluence. He discerns as it has come to be that this is stress. This is the origination of stress. This is the cessation of stress. This is the way leading to the cessation of stress. These are effluence. This is the origination of effluence. This is the cessation of effluence. This is the way leading to the cessation of effluence. His heart, thus knowing, thus seeing, is released from the effluent of sensuality, released from the effluent of becoming, released from the effluent of ignorance. With release, there is the knowledge released. He discerns that birth is ended, the holy life fulfilled, the task done, there is nothing further for this world. So I'll conclude the reading here. Whereas the suttas seem to talk about jhana quite a bit, the, uh, the teachers in our tradition don't tend to, except maybe Ajahn Brahm, from what I've heard. And I'm curious if any of the Ajahns have noticed that or can speak to that, um, or have heard any teachers in our tradition talk about jhana one way or the other. Um, you know, my experience is, is that they do talk about jhana factors, but just don't label, put labels on it in terms of the categories so much. I mean, some, some might, but, but just to keep away from the uh, tendency to um, measure ourselves up against categories uh, and attainment uh, and to create that kind of sense of you know, me who has attained this or me who has not attained this. Um, that kind of, you know, comparison that leads to a lot of self-view. Um, but that also, you know, I mean, it seems like I've heard lots of reference to, you know, the, the jhana factors, you know, what it takes to develop a still uh, mind that's capable of uh, seeing things clearly, seeing things uh, for reflection. Um, so you hear, you know, plenty about Vitaka, Vichara, Bhiti, Sukha, Ekagata, Ekodibhava, and, um, but referred to as qualities that are all part and parcel of the process of uh, pulling the mind together so that it, it can see things clearly without trying to you know, create distinctions of attainment, achievement, that kind of thing. The word samadhi, though, is, is used. Like quite, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like yeah. th that word's not shied away from. Mm -hmm. Why not? Because it's important. <laughs> but do you know what I mean, though? Like, I guess I totally see what you're saying. Like all the factors leading to what we would yeah. call jhana. 
but it, in the same way, the factors leading to samadhi are in, the word samadhi is still used quite freely. Well, yeah, I mean, because it refers to a quality of of mind that's you know essential for development of the path. That that collectedness, that um, uh, you know, stability of the mind that's uh, uh, very strong and and stable, uh, such that it's not involved with distraction, uh, moving about here and there, getting lost from. Uh, its uh, its purpose of of seeing phenomena clearly, so I mean, to me that's samadhi. You know, I mean, you know, I know that it's also defined as the four jhanas, uh, per se. But you know, uh, and that's you know quite accurate as far as I'm concerned. But it's also um, used differently in our tradition, uh, not differently, but just again to point away from that categorization, that measuring against categories to point towards a, an experience of, of mind that's strong, unwavering, uh, and able to uh, be still and clear. Yeah, I could, I could speak to that as well. Uh, I, I think samadhi is, is more like a, a broad term, uh, and I think the Kruvajans and the Ajans, especially Western Ajans, <coughs> tradition, try to shy away from the word jhana because it's secha. It's it's defined in probably a, almost a thousand different ways by a thousand different teachers in the West, and uh, and of course each way is like this is the one true, this is the one true definition, and all the other definitions are mistaken. So uh, so I think shying away from the word jhana because of that but uh, but like uh, uh, samadhi being more of like like bhikkhuni damadina talks about it in a way i really liked where it's like she she says you know, development of the four foundations of mindfulness is development of samadhi is development of the factors of right concentration so i really i like that that mm -hmm. kind of definition developing or the uh, what is the development of right concentration? It, it's coupled with the other seven path, path factors. So like, it's this integrated. Samadhi is, I think, is more like an integrated term uh, than, uh, than jhana is. Although it is interesting that, uh, although we're um, in this retreat encouraging ourselves to, or Lokpa Cha encourage us encourages us to shy away from teachings of other traditions. It is interesting to look at the etymology of the word jhana, because in uh, Thai, the word is jhan, Chinese is chan, Japanese is zen. All these come from the word jhana as the, as the root. So they all, some traditions do take it as like, we're a chan meditation <coughs> tradition, or it's the same. It's sort of, they're, they're talking about the same thing. And, and just for me, with the, like the word jhana, Ajahn Suchito points out, and I, I really appreciate, you know, he says, well, you know, there is the repeated phrase often, you know, it's like a jaya tipiko way, you know, which uh, Ajahn Jeff refers to as do jhana, you know, monks, but Ajahn Suchito says more like, he prefers the image just come from translating it as absorb, you know, jaya ti means to absorb, uh, and that, that that's a quality, you know, of attention, quality of mind that one can relate to, you know, when one is satisfied and contented and happy, uh, you know, then one is able to absorb in something and to just really devote one's full attention to it. Uh, and that that has a very friendly flavor to it, a very encouraging flavor to it, rather than a, a categorical definition that uh, one has to, you know, have a certain number of factors present in a certain, you know, level to uh, then be one who is an attainer of first genre, an attainer of second genre. So, jayati, absorb. And that, that also points to like a, a more like a natural, it's a more like a naturalness mm -hmm. of the progression, like, like a sila, 
naturally mm. progresses to non-remorse and contentment and well-being, which mm. naturally progresses to a calm mind, mm. right? samadhi. Quite interesting. There is also a vinya issue with regards to the word jhana, in that if one, you know, if one makes a false claim to have attained jhana, one commits a parajika and is no longer a monk. And even if one makes a true statement that one has attained jhana to a layperson, that's still a uh, confessable pachiti. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, that's not, and even though, even if you just start talking about it, it can cause a lot of anxiety if you start worrying, did I actually, did I make a claim there? Mm -hmm. You know, what? And, I mean, many wise monks just, not worth it, stay away. And that may have been the Buddha's intention. Yeah, even implicit claims are, are an offense. So, yeah, it's, it's a big danger. So, would that also apply to uh, Samadhi or that would be for the, Like, I was just kind of wondering because maybe Samadhi does that include, like, right mindfulness also rather than just the jhana? And if so, it seems like that wouldn't be a. You know, something. Maybe we can get into a, a, the. But just, just like what Ajahn Chan said, just like Jhana being, you know, that's a, you know, like super, super mundane or whatever, but Samadhi maybe, yeah, not, not quite that level. If you were implying, if you were implying that you had attained the Jhanas and you knew it was, knew you hadn't, right. that would be a, a danger. Right. If you were using speech in that way. There was a part that was talking about uh, knowledge and vision, something leading to knowledge and vision, um, and then it talked about the day and the night and light. Um, I can't remember what list that was a part of, and anyway, could somebody please flesh that part out a little bit? That's perception of light, developing a perception of light, right. so that the mind is, has the perception of daytime even at nighttime, like the, the mind is, is filled with light. That's just the, the Buddha saying that you develop the perception of light. One is to overcome sloth and torpor, but two to develop. One who develops the perception of light, the result is knowledge and vision as well. And that's generally referring to like psychic power kinds of things, powers of the mind, powers of the chitta, to be able to see different realms, you know, develop the vision to see into other realms. So that section of the four uses of, of concentration or the four developments of concentration refers more to the development of, the, of those mind powers, I think. Yeah. So it's not, sometimes it's like yata, yat, buddha, yana, dasana is translated as knowledge and vision of things as they come to be, but it sounds like, and it makes a lot of sense of why it would be a separate category, but what you're saying is that that's a little different. It's more towards the psychic powers and like sort of the insight knowledge. Because because if it is sort of insights in those four categories about developing concentration, it wouldn't quite make sense. Yeah, there's yeah, you know, I get a little bit uh, mixed up, or right now I am a little bit because there's the knowledge and vision in that reference to the psychic powers, but there's also knowledge and vision of the way things are, right, right, right. Um, which uh, has a different connotation, more towards uh, development of insight, I think, right. and I can't remember the poly. But with perception of light, I think it's more broad too. Yeah, like that one is just oh. knowledge and vision could be quite broad. It, you know, we can't really pin down what exactly is that referring to in that instance. Mm -hmm. But uh, that's the whole. That's what gave rise to the commentaries, and even the different commentaries say different things. But uh, the Buddha spoke in in broad ways as well. You know. Yeah, I, I think it could it could refer to insight. But also, I've heard it said that developing perception of light can lead to things like divine eye. And that yeah, that's what I think in that case it's referring to, because you have the second two sections that mm -hmm. refer more to the development of, uh, to of the insight, insight and the ending of the affluence, as far as I get it, anyway. The word is used in both context. Sometimes it's referring to both, to inclusively to include both the higher um, uh, noble attainments as well as psychic powers. And 
is sometimes used to refer to just psychic powers. And it's both the top of time and the in both situations. Uh, Abhinya is a uh, higher and higher knowledge. Yeah. yeah, I forgot the exact phrase, but that phrase, knowledge and vision, it can be used in both contexts. Yeah, is knowledge and vision. Right, I, yeah, I don't think it's